Hello again. Welcome to the second talk after lunch. Uh, you're 45 minutes away from a coffee break, a cake break. Uh, <laughs> so bear with us. Um, I'd like to welcome Jonatas Baldin, uh, who's going to be giving a talk uh, entitled In the Land of the Serverless, Who Uses Zappa is King. Uh, please welcome Jonatas. Um, okay, okay, okay. Hi there. Uh, this is in the land of serverless, who uses Zappa is king. Uh, my name is Jonatas Balding. Uh, I'm a Brazilian developer. Uh, I work at a company called Cheesecake Labs, this company here. We make products for startups, mostly on, from clients on Silicon Valley. This is my first international talk in my first like international conference outside of Brazil, so yay. Uh, also, uh, the Python conference is happening like this weekend at Brazil, and I chose to come here because Africa. So I, I would like if you could just say hi from our friends at Brazil, so we could re reverse it first. Like, hi Brazil. Okay, one, two, three. Hi Brazil. Oh, that's nice. Let's do this. So let me. So like, one. No, no, no. All right. One, two, three. Hi, Yay. Thank you. I will send them afterwards. So, okay. So, let's talk a little bit about serverless today. So, uh, first of all, what is serverless? Uh, serverless, it is like a concept and a framework. There's a company called serverless, but we'll stick with the concept today. So serverless is a cloud computing execution model. Uh, it's a way to use cloud computing resources. Uh, differently for, from get like a Docker container or from getting an EC2 instance on AWS. So what is the, the big deal here? Uh, the resources that you're going to use on this serverless architecture, they are dynamically allocated. So if you don't use it, you don't have resources. If you need like a lot of resources, you have them. And also, you pay by the execution. So if you just run a function for like uh, 100 milliseconds, you're going to just pay for that. So like this is the two pillars of serverless computing. So this is like the evolution of computing today. Uh, after we got like virtual servers, we could isolate operating systems. Uh, but we have problems with dis disk space and uh, resource allocations like RAM and CPU. Then we got like the boom of cloud computing, mostly with AWS. So these machines, now we could like just pay with our credit card and got some machines uh, somewhere that we will execute our code. That was nice. Uh, then some people came with containers. Like containers is really old technology, but Docker has changed it, how, it has, how it's done. So now with Docker, like it's really easy to use containers. So it was. Uh, another step on how to use uh, resources for a machine. And now we have serverless. It's like the mind-blowing stuff. Uh, from my opinion, I think it's like the future for a lot of cases. It's not a silver bullet, but we can use it like for a lot of things that you use on day to day. Uh, and I think it's pretty cool. So Martin Flower has uh, an article on his blog about defining serverless stuff. And he comes with two, two different things. First, we have backend as a service. It's like when you grab a whole service to connect with your app, with your mobile app. Things like Auth0 for authentication, or Google's Firebase for authentication as well, as, uh, database notifications. So you, you pay like the whole service, and it's ready. You just use it. And we also have FAST, it's function as a service. So this is the, the main talk I'm going to give today. Uh, it's about FAST. So what is it? Uh, you grab your piece of code, you put somewhere, and you execute it. It's just it. It's a platform to hold your little pieces of code, your functions. Uh, some uh, backend as a service already has this. Like Fire in Firebase, you can connect to Google Cloud Functions, which is the FAST for Google. So they are kind of uh, mixed up today, but I'm going to be talking mostly about FAST. So yeah, let's talk about the principles. We have some here. So single purpose functions. When you think about serverless, you're going to get your code, put somewhere, and execute it. Uh, so these functions, they, they should uh, have a single purpose, uh, like the Unix philosophy, one tool for the right job. 
uh, like for the the minimum job. So, but it doesn't need to be in this way. You could go, like get a Django full, applica full application and put somewhere to be executed with the serverless concepts. So it can be a single purpose function, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, Event-driven architecture. So everything in serverless is event-driven. So how do you execute these functions? Wh uh, when it is executed? So we have events all over the place. So for example, in AWS, if you upload a file to a bucket, this is an event. You could trigger some functions. If you add uh, a row in a database, that can be considered an event and can trigger the function. Also, uh, we have like API gateway. So access to endpoints like get methods, post methods could also be an event. So these things, they trigger, uh, they trigger these functions and in an uh, event-driven way. We have like the abstracted servers. In serverless, we don't have servers, right? So no. Uh, we do have them, but they're like really, really well abstracted. So we don't manage them. We can't actually manage them. We can change the operating system. We can tune the operating system. We can do nothing to them. So the servers is abstracted for us on the serverless architecture. Ephemeral environments, this is awesome. So uh, you're going to trigger a function. You're going to execute it. So uh, there's nothing there yet, just your code somewhere. Uh, the platform uh, goes up with an environment. So it spin up some kind of an environment. It could be a container. It could be like a virtual env. We don't know how, how the, the vendors do this. But they, sp oh, sorry, yeah. They spin up this environment, execute your function, and destroy it. So it's totally ephemeral. Uh, you, don't, you don't have access to the memory after the function is ex executed. So you can't rely on context between executions. Every time your function uh, executes, you have to do all the context needed to it, uh, provide the, the results that you want. So you can't rely on memory. You, on local memory, you can't rely on local disk, so you have to execute once, uh, the environment goes up, goes down, and it's done. Pay by the execution, so you pay by the millisecond, so you see if a uh, function executes like to one minute, it's just going to pay one minute. It's not like an EC2 instance that uh, stays idle at some point and you are paying for that but not using, so with serverless, you generally just pay as you use the functions. And also built-in built scalability. So when you're using like some server, uh, some AWS, I'm talking here mostly about AWS because that's what Zappa uses, but there's also other vendors as well. But on AWS, if you're using uh, EC2 instance, you have like to configure the outscaling stuff. You have like to put some rules to make some health checks. Uh, even if you use like ECS, the, the Docker stuff for AWS, you also have to uh, uh, set some thresholds, like if the memory goes down, memory goes up, you spin up more servers, you spin down more servers. But on serverless, there's not this configuration. The scalability is like, it's, bu it's built in. You don't, have, you don't have how to manage this. So if your function is like executor one per, once per minute, it's going to be fine. If you executed like 10,000 10, times per minute, it is also going to be fine. So we have like this, the scalability is built in on the technology. So some commercial providers, uh, we have like Google Cloud Functions, the first one. We have AWS Lambda, IBM OpenWhiskey. We have of zero web task and also Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Azure Functions. So you can go on these guys and start using some kind of fast platform on them. We also have some open source providers. So if you want like to bring the serverless uh, inside your data center, inside your own premises, you can deploy it. We have like Fission, the IBM OpenWhiskey is now open source, it's under the umbrella of the Apache Foundation, so you can also use it. We have Iron Functions, we also have Kubeless. It's a guy that uses Kubernetes to run functions. Uh, it's not on the slide, but it's very cool. So you actually don't need to go with cloud providers to use the serverless today. You could deploy it on your premises or try it out on your laptop or anything like that. 
So since the, I'm going to talk mostly about Amazon today, I'm going to just lay out some simple services that we use on, on serverless over there. First, we have Lambda. So this is the, the place that you put your code. So you grab your code, like put on a zip file and put over there to be executed. This is the guy. We have the S3 service. It's not tied directly to the serverless architecture, but most examples use it. Uh, mostly like when you're uploading some file, you execute some function. Is there, there's the resize image examples, like the most used one. So you put some file in a bucket, trigger a function that resizes this image is saved in saves uh, in other buckets. So it's one type of event that you can have on AWS. And we also have the API gateway. This is a guy that you can uh, construct endpoints over it. So you can like have some endpoints, some research, some methods that can trigger these functions. Uh, some use cases. Let me drink a little water. OK, some use cases. So it's not a silver bullet, mostly because like there's a timeout to execute. As you pay by the execution, imagine it's your function like uh, it's holding like the executing for a month in a row. It's go you're going to pay like a really, really, really big uh, bill. So you have timeouts. So this timeout uh, is one of the things that makes it's not a silver bullet for every use case. But uh, some of them like web backends, so it's really uh, quick and nice to build backends for web apps, for mobile apps. Bots. Bots are, are kind of like event-driven uh, by default. So uh, it talks about, it responds to you. So it's a nice uh, place to put bots. Data processing. So if you have like a lot of data and you need to process sometimes, you just grab the data, process it, and the function is destroyed. Also a nice case. And IoT. So if you manage a lot of devices, you could put functions on serverless architectures to like receive data from IoT, send data to IoT devices. It's really nice. So benefits. We have cost. Like cost, really. Really, it's really, really cheap. This, this, this cheap. Like the first million requests per month are free on the free tier of AWS. So a million, one million requests, free. And then uh, each million requests thereafter is like 0 0.20 cents of dollar. It's like this much per request. It's like, it's really, really cheap. So I think uh, this, is, this was one of the most convincing points to use serverless. It's the price. But don't, don't be so attached to it like I am, because you can like shoot yourself on the foot. Because uh, if you execute your function like millions and millions and millions of time, it can actually be cheaper to get a EC2 instance or a reserved one. So if you're like executing your function more than two and a half million uh, times, you may want to get something. Uh, the benefits. So we have like infinite scale, infinite scale. So nothing is infinite, but you don't have to manage the scalability and scaling is like built in. So we can just use your functions as you want and it's going to be all right. Package and deploy. So your code now just needs to run on a zip file. Uh, it just needs to be on a zip file. So you don't have to manage like Docker image or doc containers or anything like that. You just put your code on a zip file, put on the platform, it will be ex executed. Uh, another thing is time to market. So since it's like really, really quick to deploy your function, you could go on market like and uh, provide value for your users in a quick, quick manner. So time to matter is one another benefit. And operation management. So since you don't have servers, you don't need to manage them. So you don't need operations anymore, right? So no. Every time you say no ops, this is a demean dice. So really, don't say no ops ever. Your friend could be dying now. So there's this phrase that I really like a lot. Serverless doesn't remove ops complexity. It increases it exponentially. 
So imagine that you have like a monolith, it's quick to deploy, uh, it works always, all the time, it's quick to debug, to see if you have problems, anything like that. If I have microservices, we have start to have some more problems, uh, like debugging, like uh, seeing uh, the cascading failure of services. But if you have serverless, like we have functions all over the place. So imagine you get each function of your, of your code and put somewhere to be executed. How are we going to deploy? Uh, how are we going to debug it? How are we going to see the errors? How are we going to monitor it and test it? So this is like really hard problems on the serverless today, and it increases like the ops responsibility over the the system. So don't accept the no ops statement. Uh, show this slide to the people so they can protect their friends than me. So uh, enough concepts. Let's talk about tooling. So uh, about the concepts, it's this it is this is it. So you have some code you put somewhere. It will be executed for uh, an event, uh, any kind of event that the platform supports. You're gonna pay by the execution. You don't need to scale up or scale it down. This is built in on the architecture. So this is the concept of serverless. So let's talk a little bit about tooling. So serverless frameworks. Uh, and that's risk over there because serverless, uh, the word serverless is an actually uh, framework, so, but there are others. So uh, it has to be like two years since the first uh, serverless framework or, or better the serverless concept with AWS is starting this game. Uh, and you already have like 20 frameworks, 20 plus. And every day you have like, it's, it's almost like JavaScript where I have like frameworks like crazy. But why? Why, why this is needed if it's so simple uh, architecture? Because it's not that easy, actually. So everything is new. Uh, it's been two years since it, the Lambda comes up. So it's pretty new. It's not easy. So you have a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving pieces. Uh, you have like different providers, uh, no specs whatsoever. So all every provider, like, uh, give you the service in their way. So if you want like to change providers, you are li you are li you are going to have some problems. So this is why we have frameworks. So they can abstract all of this for us. So they can uh, put our code on the zip file. They can deploy our code. They can make sure that the events are set up correctly. So this is why we have frameworks on the first place. And then we have Zappa. Not the Zappa, Zappa. So who likes the Zappa is awesome as well. But <laughs> this one. So uh, Zappa is a framework for Python applications that use uh, AWS uh, for deploying and stuff. Uh, it's really, really awesome. It's really easy to use. Unfortunately, it doesn't, uh, today it doesn't support another providers like IBM or Google Cloud Functions and another other languages, but I think there's a feature supporting Python, so kudos for that. But let's take a, a look about the features that Zappa provides for us. So Python with applications. Zappa is used to deploy with applications, like Django or Flask, for example. It's great for micro and micro services. So if you want to deploy like just a little bit of code of Flask, like just a simple endpoint, it's okay for you, but if you want to deploy your whole Django application, it's also okay. So you can do both. Uh, it uses AWS Lambda and AWS API Gateway uh, on the back. It also uses the AWS event sources. So if you want to configure some uh, event triggering, uh, besides the endpoints, you can do that. It supports Chrome-like events, so you can uh, uh, use some functions, execute some functions like every day or every week, whatsoever. It has logs, so you can see all the logs from the AWS services in a cool way. It has rollback uh, environment variables from S3, so we can take our environments and put on a JSON file somewhere. It has multiple stage deployments, so you can have your, you can have your dev, QA, staging, and production deployments, uh, environments. It has Django management commands. Yeah, this is awesome. So you can like, run the migrate, run any Django command that you want from your console. 
It has a keep warm function. So uh, this one comes with a uh, parenthesis. Remember that I said about the ephemeral environment. So the environment goes up, function executed, environment goes down. Uh, but it's not like that always. Uh, we have a thing called keep warm. We have like warm functions. So your function goes up, uh, AWS uh, realizes that you're going to execute it a few times. Uh, I don't know, using the pattern that they have. And they don't spin up, they don't spin down the environment. So you can use it multiple times. Uh, to keep this function warm, uh, Zappa comes with a feature that you ping your function like every X minutes. So it's always warm. So this environment doesn't have to come up, save you some seconds of latency. Uh, it has free SSL. So if you're using like Halt 53 or Let's Encrypt, you have just a little comments to put your custom domain and to also uh, put SSL on them. In and this globally distributed availability. So we have like AWS all around the world. We have AWS, uh, AWS all around the world. And you could deploy your functions all around the world. So it's this, this feature is on beta, but like it deploys your function uh, in every region that supports AWS Lambda. It's pretty cool. You could check it out. So uh, I'm full vacation mode here. Like I came to Cape Town to be on this conference. I'll spend some days to explore the city. I didn't brought my laptops. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be like a demo time. So you have to trust me that this comments work. So just trust me. So uh, installing Zappa, pip install Zappa. No problem here. Zappa init. So it's gonna ask you a few questions, like it's gonna try to uh, it's gonna try to recognize your application if it's a Flask or it's a Django one. It's gonna ask you which region do you want to deploy and anything like that. So this is like the, the output of the file. You have a Zappa settings.json file. You have like the project name, profile name, runtime, anything like that. After that, you just type Zappa deploy and it's gonna deploy on AWS. Of course, you have to have your AWS credentials uh, locally, like on the AWS config file for that. But it's just, really, it's just it. You type Zappa deploy and everything works. It will say deployment complete here somewhere else. You click on that, it's going to be working. Here's how uh, it show on the AWS dashboard after deployed. So I deployed the application called Hello World on the environments dev. So I have like the zip file that was uploaded. Here on the configuration, we have like the runtime, the handler is like the, uh, the principal function that's being executed. We have the roles, so the permissions that Zap create for us. And uh, like the timeout, 30 seconds per execution. The memory, so we can configure the memory of our function. Uh, this is the API gateway. So we have like an endpoint called a proxy. So every time that a request hit this endpoint, it's going to execute the Lambda function. You can see here, like it's going to execute the function and return to the user. So uh, everything is, uh, on this case, everything is handled by the application. We don't need to create multiple, multiple uh, endpoints over here or resources or anything like that. Everything is handled by your application. Another cool thing we can do. So we update our code. Zappa updates dev, so we don't need to deploy it again. You just zip our new code and put it over there. We can roll back, so all these functions, they are versioned by AWS. So we can roll back our functions. Uh, this is much like Rerocal rollback, really nice. We can see the logs with the tail, so uh, some logs will be there. If you see these comments, like, it will be all colored, uh, all pretty and stuff. It was a PR that I made to the project. It was uh, very ugly uh, before that. You can invoke uh, Python commands. So you can hope like a print or execute some functions. You can invoke a, a Python commands on, on the AWS. You can use uh, Django manage commands. So if you have like your migrate files over there, you can uh, execute the migration and create the tables and whatsoever. And you can have multiple environment uh, uh, environments. So if you have like dev station production, you put all of them on the same file, you can differently configure them, and you have all of them. 
and then you just select the uh, the environment. So I was doing Zappa deploy dev. Now I can just do Zappa deploy staging, and uh, the staging configuration will be used. And there's like much, much, much more. You can see at the Zappa repository. Uh, really nice stuff. Really nice code. Take a look at that. Uh, so, some drawbacks here. Not about the Zappa, but about the serverless as a role. Vendor control and locking, also with an asterisk. So the first time I present this was in Brazil, like a couple months ago. And vendor control locking is indeed a problem. So if you use AWS, you're like tied to AWS. If you use Google Cloud functions, you're tied to them. But the serverless company, the, the, the company that has this name, uh, is developing a guy called Event Gateway. So you could like deploy this somewhere and use functions for different providers to interact with. So this is like this is a problem that is already being solved, like just a couple couple of months ago. So you can see that uh, it's indeed young, and it's indeed evolving uh, very quickly. This technology, uh, we can do several optimizations. So we can mess with the kernel. We can uh, change this CCTL file, anything like that. And we don't have in-service state, so we can't rely on t on the environment to hold some to hold some uh, state. We just need to execute the function with all the context that we need. Uh, some people call these also drawbacks, but I call them opportunities. So uh, it's pretty pretty young. So we have a lot of opportunity for tooling, for open space, open source projects, for learning learning teaching like uh, blogs, articles, books, and everything like that, and lots of improvements. So we can uh, do a lot of work to improve this this new architecture. Uh, and the quest that I think that everyone could be wrong, could be wondering is if this is production ready. And I say yes, but try it first. It's not for every case. Uh, it maybe doesn't solve your problem, or it maybe costs too much for you. But it's indeed uh, production ready. Uh, you can use it for a lot of things using Zappa, or using other frameworks, or using no framework at all, just deploying your functions manually, it doesn't matter, it really works. It's indeed awesome, and you can indeed use it in production. Uh, for closing, I'm the creator of a weekly call Serverless Weekly. You can go on this URL and sign up every week, minus this next two, because I'm on vacation. Uh, there's always some cool links to check it out there. And this is in the land of serverless, who is Zappa is king. I'm Jonathan Bojin. You can follow me on Twitter on this one. Please give me some dopamine after the, the talk. <laughs> and uh, also, I'm going to be in Seoul like until the 18th. So if you want to hang out, like anything like that, just send me a message. And I would like to explore your, your town. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Jonatas. Uh, looks you. like we have a question at the back there. Uh, hi, we've actually hi used there. Zappa um, quite a lot. Nice. Um, although, uh, one thing that we found is, for instance, the whiskey middleware is trying to do too much. So, for instance, we had a cookie issue where all the cookies get based something base64 encoded and then decoded on the other side which when you're testing things breaks a lot of a lot of things so it seems it's a interesting system and the package management's cool but in some ways it's doing too much and AWS also changes so quickly that something yeah. might work one week and then another week with API gateway it doesn't work yeah I think this is indeed a problem uh, also, because like there are a lot, a lot of pull requests on Zappa, and I think that some there are some pull requests that it's already like old technology for AWS. Uh, I think it's uh, I still use it. Uh, I think it's good to use, but I agree with you. Uh, sometimes it can be overkill. Sometimes uh, you have like if you have to change too much your application to fit in the serverless uh, structure. I don't think it's cool to do that. I think. You maybe need to change your code a little bit, but not too much. So that's it. Thank you. 
Any more questions? I think we have one here. Hi. Um, Hi there. I, I ran into issues a while ago with um, non-Python packages, or, or uh, especially PostgreSQL package, um, but that was shortly after the Python 3 support was enabled on AWS. Do you know if that's still an issue? Um, uh, could you repeat? I didn't get it, sorry. Uh, Non-Python, non non-pure Python packages. Okay, um, so like with C extensions and something like that. So uh, you, you can compile stuff on serverless, right? So if you have C extension specs, uh, you cannot just go there and install it. So what uh, you could do, you have like the the wheels package, so Zappa has support for wheel packages, so if you are using like Pill or Psycho PG2 or anything like that, you go onto the wheel repository and download it. If there's not a wheel and you need to use some package, you have to actually do some workarounds, like got into an instance, because serverless runs on the uh, AWS AMI instance, so have to spin up one, download the package, uh, compile it, Download all the files and put it on our repository. It's like it's indeed an ugly workaround. Or you could like try to port it to wheels, so you can have the the Zap infrastructure to handle this. But I think this is like this is the the two solutions that you could. Thank you. One more. Uh, so one thing I like to know. Um, Back in 2008, the old-fashioned Google App Engine standard environment that seems to um, share some attributes with serverless, like, for example, uh, you only pay per use and uh, probably a few others. Um, is, it, is it sort of like a, like a uh, serverless thing that was ahead of its time, uh, or what's the most diff main differences between that? Yeah, and yeah I, I think it follows like the, the principles of packaging everything into a zip file and paying by the execution. But I think the, the thing that is mostly changed is the event-driven. Uh, event-driven architecture because now the the third-party services on the platform they all generate events of some kind so you can react to them like executor function on some way and I think this is like the one of the most awesome things on serverless today because uh, you can like instead of writing your whole application you may just write some glues between services uh, to reach market faster so I think this is like the most difference between them Is it? Last question, anyone? Yes. Um, if, you have, if you have an application that grows out of scale for the kind of serverless architecture, what would you recommend doing? So I uh, didn't get it, the, the first part, sorry. Um, <coughs> if you, you kind of said like you have a certain like scale at which it makes sense to use serverless, but if you start having more invocations of functions, it actually starts becoming cheaper to run something like an instance. Okay. But, so what would your recommendation be at that point? Like, is, is there something that you can just run your functions in a, in a container or in a um, cloud instance, or what would you do then? Okay, so I think you could use like some open source solution if you wanted to try it out. But uh, you can like run a container to run uh, like not only AWS. You can use Kubernetes that runs containers that will run functions. Docker Swarm uh, also have like a mode for running functions, so we can use it this way. But I think this is this is what you get. Okay. So hi, to the vein. Hi, to the vein. So I to ask, uh, I know that in the serverless framework, there's a way to run some kind of simulation of your code uh, locally on a dev machine. Do you, is there a mechanism to do this in Zappa okay, before so you actually deploy your code to uh, an environment? Okay, so Zappa has a Docker image that you can like deploy locally and try to run it locally. But I've tried myself, but it, I don't think it's reliable as uh, it's using like the, the serverless framework one. Um, one thing that is coming up is like the SAML for AWS that you can run the whole serverless, the whole Lambda uh, offline, like your local machine. I think this could solve the problem, but uh, I don't think so. 
well, uh, Zappa has his Docker machine, so you can try it out. But I don't thought it was really reliable. Uh, hello. Hi there. I just wanted to find out if you have, if you know of any companies that are currently using Zappa, like commercially on production, and what the commercially. Are that. So uh, I think uh, on the company I work for, we're using like more inside projects. We don't use in production for like uh, not lack of confidence, but lack of opportunity over there on the projects that we work for. But the guy that started Zappa, they it, uh, he has a company called Gun.io, and he's like a, he's like a dev shop, I think so, something like that. And they indeed use Zappa in production, but I don't know uh, other companies like big companies that are using it. Any more questions? I think it's okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.